Dear colleagues and friends, uh, good morning and welcome to the last uh, COVID-19 vaccine summit of the year. I want to take this opportunity to express my, my gratitude and thanks to, to our president uh, of FIU, Dr. Maka Rosenberg, and to Dean uh, Thomas Gilarte for their continuous support uh, on this important initiative on uh, continual education in uh, uh, on COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccination. This is really a relevant initiative and, and uh, we also thanks to our GIC and the Robert Stemple College uh, team for the committing, uh, commitment and, and support. Today, we have a magnificent uh, panel of experts who will be presenting the most relevant updates and challenges in controlling the COVID-19 pandemic. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to the Global Health Conference of the America of the Americas 2022 in Cartagena, Colombia, on uh, December 2 to 5th. And, and by the way, just take advantage of the early bird uh, registration. Um, without any further delay, I want to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Thomas Gilarte, our Dean of the College of uh, uh, Robert Stemple College of Public Health and, and Social Work. Uh, Dean Gilarte, the, the floor is, uh, is yours. And welcome to, to our COVID-19 summit. Good morning, buenos dias, everyone. Um, I, I, uh, this is from FIU, uh, Stemple College in sunny and beautiful Miami. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Espinal and the Global Health Consortium team for making this event possible. As we gather for the final COVID-19 vaccine summit, I want to personally thank the experts with us today and for their dedication and commitment to share factual information about this virus. Your work to support the greater good does not go unnoticed. This summit series has brought together thousands of people from all over the world to keep the conversation alive around the importance of vaccinations. These discussions are vital for the health and well being of our families and communities. As Temple College and faculty and students work every day with communities to share information that helps lead healthy lives. Our college is home to the Global Health Consortium and to a host of other essential disciplines that positively impact communities near and far. Stemple College students learn from renowned oral experts working in public health, social welfare, dietetics and nutrition, and disaster management. Each year, we rise in rankings due to the incredible work done here every day. I encourage you to learn more about Stemple College and to visit us here in Miami. In closing, I would like to say that I appreciate everyone tuning in, and I hope that you find today's discussions enlightening and informative. I know the team has developed an excellent program for you. And now it is my honor to introduce to you Florida International University fifth president, Mark B. Rosenberg. President Rosenberg was previously the university provost and chancellor of the Florida State University System. He's an expert in international relations and founded FIU Latin American and Caribbean Center. President Rosenberg, thank you for supporting this series and for being with us here today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dean. Good morning, everyone. We buenos dias. Por parte de, de nuestra universidad, yo quiero darles uh, todos una bienvenida muy cordial a este, digamos, último programa eh, que llevamos a cabo por parte de nuestro Stemple College of Public Health and Social Work. I also want to give a special thanks to the Pan American Health Organization, the World Health Organization, Baylor College of Medicine's National School of Tropical Medicine. Great to see Dr. Hodis again. And I wanna thank in particular, Dean Guiarte, Carlos Espinal, uh, uh, Neda Roldan here at our FIU for your continuous leadership in these very uh, difficult times. 
So we first launched this summit back in February. We were all struggling with how to contain the deadly virus, as well as this uh, financial burden that uh, has been created uh, for so many families, communities, uh, and countries. Now we know a little bit more. Uh, we, we have vaccines, we have testing availability, and we are slowly seeing light at the end of the tunnel. The fight's far from over, however, and we gotta continue. We gotta keep on keeping on. And we have to encourage those around us to make vaccines available, and uh, we gotta encourage healthy habits to curb the spread. So today we once again bring together knowledgeable experts from throughout our hemisphere and the world to address lingering questions and lessons learned from COVID-19. Where do we stand? Where are we going? How can we keep our communities safe and healthy? Those are continuing issues. They're not gonna go away, but lessons have been learned, many lessons. And hopefully those lessons uh, will come out in the conversation today. And at FIU, which is a public university, fairly young, we were just opened in 1972, right here in Miami, we look forward to continuing to work together as we find a new normal. Our FIU is about almost 60,000 students, many of whom are from Latin America and the Caribbean, which we're very proud of, but we're all working together to find solutions. We all believe deeply in collaboration. We understand that it's not some of us, it's all of us uh, who have to work together. We've had a very strong response at our university and in our community to this scourge of COVID. And the goal that I had set uh, last year was that we got to find a way, we got to find a way to get better at being better. And indeed, as a consequence of the people working together and the collaboration at our universities, yes, we did move up uh, in the rankings. Yes, we have figured out a way to work through this disaster of a pandemic to ensure that our students could have the success they deserve and to ensure that we could bring solutions to the community working collaboratively with you that would help to restore the prosperity and the well being that, that we all seek. That's so uh, important to us. So I want to thank you uh, for being with us. I'm definitely looking forward uh, to the proceedings. We see you as partners, as collaborators. We welcome you to our public university. Uh, we are not going to stop in our vigilance and our passion to work collaboratively and to find solutions, not just for our community, but working together with you for our entire hemisphere. Thank you so much. Have a great conference. Morning, everyone. Buenos dias a todos. Un dia. I hope that you are doing fine, that everybody has been having a great year so far, given all the issues in the world, COVID expanding, the Delta variant and all others. But I hope that everybody has a lot of knowledge on how to keep safe and those who have been lucky to get vaccination I hope that this is a, a something that is giving you some peace of mind. However, however, we have to remember that we have to keep on with the safety measures and public health measures. So today we're gonna to have an, a very, very nice and interesting panel. Um, and today's activity, we're gonna break it in two panels as we always do the summit. The first one is gonna be focusing most into the US 
and the second one is going to be focusing on the global one, and that will be moderated by my colleague, Andrea Rusk. So I, I thank you for being here today. I thank you for joining us, and I thank most of all our speakers. Today's speakers uh, are first-class speakers. I think that you will find out that uh, we have uh, managed to bring in, and I really appreciate Dr. Peter Hottes, who's gonna be speaking about science versus anti-science, something that we know that is uh, part of uh, daily life. And he is a real, real person speaking about anti-science and bringing the facts and the evidence for everybody to understand what's going on. Um, then Dr. George Benjamin, he is the APHA executive director, and he's gonna be speaking about COVID-19 vaccine coverage and case rates in the United States. And then we're gonna close with a presentation from Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, and she's gonna be speaking about the impact of COVID-19 in children in the United States. And then we're gonna have, uh, I hope, a very interactive discussion with the three of them. And let me tell you that already we are getting a lot of uh, questions. So don't hesitate to, to place your questions. I know that is going to be very interesting. And uh, the more questions, the more interactive we can have. Of course, we're gonna be filtering them and try to put them together uh, so that we don't have repetitive questions. Now, I would like to thank uh, the staff in uh, FIU office in Washington, DC, where I'm based now. As you can see here in the back is FIU. So this is the offices of FIU in Washington, D.C. on New York Avenue. So I really want to thank Dr. Carlos Becerra, the office manager, Diana and Lazaro, who have been very helpful to support me and have me all the setup here for this morning. So let's go and start with this presentation of Dr. Peter Juarez. Uh, he's gonna be speaking about science and anti-sciences. Uh, Peter, Dr. Cotes, uh, you all know him because he has been uh, uh, with us uh, in the previous summits and he is a very active uh, person in the arena of, uh, of COVID vaccines. He's a scientist. He, he works at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He is someone who is a very active tweeter and uh, you all know him. If you have been following him on Twitter, you know how active he is. He's active in, in, in national television. And uh, I, I think that everybody knows about Dr. Hottes. So I really appreciate Dr. Hottes to be here with us. Dr. Hottes, from Washington to Houston, you have the floor, sir. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. And it's an honor to be here. You know, our, our School of Tropical Medicine uh, has been working very closely with FIU now for the whole decade we've been in existence. And in some ways we feel like we're brother schools or sister schools. So uh, I've been a frequent visitor to FIU and I always feel inspired when I come to FI, FIU. And uh, I like to congratulate the president uh, on, on, his, on his activities. And I look forward post-apocalypse towards uh, coming back here uh, to, to Miami. Um, uh, it's also an honor to be with these very distinguished speakers um, I'm going to try to re make remarks that would not overlap too much with the kinds of things that they might be saying. And at the same time, um, my my colleague, my science partner for the last 20 years, Dr. Botazzi, is going to be speaking as well about our COVID vaccine. So I won't talk too much about that and try to, you know, le that leaves the space about talking about, unfortunately, this terrible uh, anti-vaccine movement and aggression that we've been uh, experiencing. And I use the title here, acceptance of pediatric, acceptability of pediatric vaccines. I'll be going beyond that, but the point is this morning, uh, uh, Pfizer's announced, Pfizer BioNTech have announced they're going to apply for emergency use authorization for pediatric vaccines, five to 11 year olds. And I think there's going to be a lot of issues around acceptance uh, of that um, because based on what we've seen, especially in certain parts of the country, including the Southern United States and the Mountain West. And I thought I would talk a little bit about that. Uh, just for a word of, of who I am, I'm a MD, PhD vaccine scientist who's devoted my life to developing 
vaccines for these forgotten diseases of forgotten people, meaning the neglected tropical diseases. So uh, in the past, I've come to speak at FIU specifically about our tropical disease vaccines and the third edition of this book just came out uh, this week. So we're very, very excited about that. And we call these vaccines the anti-poverty vaccines because they're vaccines for diseases like schistosomiasis or Chagas disease or hookworm infection. These are diseases that trap people in poverty because of their long-term debilitating effects. And and about a decade ago, we, we also adopted a coronavirus vaccine program, began developing uh, low-cost coronavirus vaccines for global health for SARS and MERS, recognizing that it's just a matter of time before there's a third major coronavirus pandemic. And sure enough, when this hit and we got the COVID-19 sequence, we were able to develop and scale up a low-cost recombinant protein COVID vaccine for global health. It's the receptor binding domain on alum together with the TLR9 agonist, and it's completing now phase three trials, looking very exciting, very effective in non-human primates. We've transferred the technology with no patents to both India uh, and Indonesia, to India, to Biological E, which is one of the big vaccine producers, and to Biopharma in Indonesia. So it's one of the first fact COVID vaccines specifically designed for low and middle income countries to fill that terrible gap. And now uh, in, in India, the vaccine is known as Corbivax. We developed the production cell bank, it was licensed to BioE, and they're scaling up at 100 million doses a month. And we we're hoping emergency use listing in India is going to happen very soon. So we hope we can fill this gap because we, we're not optimistic that mRNA vaccines are going to be available for uh, low and middle income countries anytime soon, certainly over the next year. But we think this could come in pretty quickly and fill the gap. Now, the other book that I'd written earlier this year is called Preventing the Next Pandemic, Vaccine Diplomacy in the Time of Anti-Science. And a lot of the book was written before the pandemic, and it looks at some of the big social determinants that are driving back the return of disease like poverty and war and political instability, urbanization, deforestation, and this rise in anti-science. And the anti-science forces have really accelerated in the last two years. But I think not many people quite understand how how this started and what the drivers are. And I thought it would be instructive uh, to, even though it is uh, a dreary subject, I think it's important for people to understand how uh, anti-science has become so ascendant uh, in the last uh, few years. And of course, it's having a, a huge impact as so many people this is these are vaccination coverage rates in the southern United States and the Mountain West are absolutely defiant of getting vaccinated and refusing to get vaccinated. In some cases, um, just uh, concern, but in many cases, outright defiance and refusal. And that, of course, has led to this terrible Delta surge that started over the summer across the southern United States. And we have this very tragic number of 100,000 Americans now in the US, uh, mostly in the Southern US have lost their lives despite the available uh, over the summer, despite the widespread availability of safe and effective vaccines. And these are lives that did not have to be lost. These, uh, this, these are lives uh, that could have been saved had they chosen to get vaccinated. I'm, and I'm calling this death by uh, anti-science. So, so how did the, how did this begin? And and you can see that um, even though it's very uncomfortable for us as physicians or physician scientists, you know, all of our training is to not to talk about Republicans or Democrats or liberals or conservatives. But now I found, you know, in the last couple of years that the only way to talk about it is to talk about it and see how we can fix the problem because we're, sh we're clearly seeing both the COVID deaths and the um, low vaccination rates, which are going hand in hand, very much along partisan lines. So this is from uh, David Leonhardt's excellent uh, article in the New York Times a week or two ago, and a lot of that is based on Charles Gabba's data as well, showing that there's a clear blue-red um, disconnect between the, the COVID deaths, um, and most of these, of course, in, in, in the southern states, although now it's moving uh, up into the mountain west. So the question is, how did we get here? How did we come to this awful position where 
people are tying their political identity, their allegiance to conservatism by not getting vaccinated, which is obviously one of the most self-defeating things I've ever seen as as a physician scientist. How you know how did how did we get here? So I thought I'd just briefly go through in the limited time I have to kind of go through the, what I see as the three iterations of the anti-vaccine movement, at least in the modern form, starting around the early 2000s, how it began as version 1.0 around vaccines, uh, fal false claims that vaccines caused autism. Then in 2015, how it became a political movement and linked itself to political extremism on the far right. And then version 3.0, how it's globalized into this anti-vaccine, anti-science empire. So let's start with version 1.0, um, how it began claim with claims that vaccines cause autism. Well, it started out um, with a paper that was ultimately retracted in The Lancet in 1998, claiming that the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, the MMR vaccine, had the ability to cause what that time they called a pervasive developmental disorder. Now, now we call it autism. And the scientific community responded in a big way, uh, conducting large cohort studies showing that kids who got the MMR vaccine were no more likely to become autistic than kids who did not, or then conversely, kids on the autism spectrum were no more likely to have gotten MMR than kids not on the autism spectrum. And we thought that was the end of it. But then we began, what then happened was a series of switch-ups or moving the goalposts uh, by anti-vaccine groups because once the MMR links got debunked and there are still parents who um, are still concerned about the MMR vaccine, we they switched it around, said, no, it's the thimerosal preservative in vaccine. And again, the scientific community would respond. And then it was about how vaccines are being spaced too close together or alum in vaccines. So each time the scientific community moved to um, address concerns from anti-vaccine groups, the anti-vaccine groups would move the goalposts so you could never quite get there. And then you always had a chase after a new assertion. And then it switched over in some, some circles to the HPV vaccine for cervical cancer and other cancer with claims that vaccines caused the HPV vaccine caused infertility or autoimmunity, which of course was also not true. But and if that sounds familiar for COVID nineteen vaccines, that there's a reason for that because what anti vaccine groups have done is they've copy pasted their false assertions from HPV vaccine and other vaccines onto the COVID nineteen vaccine because it's easy to do and and it seems to work for them even though there's no basis for it. Um, I, I got involved in this in, in a kind of a backwards way. I'm, I'm a vaccine scientist, um, pediatric scientist develops vaccines, but I'm also the parent of four adult kids, including Rachel, who has, uh, is 28 years old, now has autism and intellectual disabilities. And a few years ago, I wrote a book called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism to basically detail the evidence showing there's no link between vaccines and autism and also about what autism is and how it begins in early fetal brain development through the action of more than 100 autism genes. So I talk about in the book the fact that we did whole exome sequencing on Rachel and 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 my wife uh, Anne and I. And by the way, if you ever were looking what the student what where I am talking now, what it really looks like, you can see it's not a very elaborate setup. It's a laptop on a box of seltzer with some papers there. That's Anne. Um, and and we did whole exome sequencing on the three of us and found a neuronal uh, spectrin mutation. So a non-red cell spectrin, uh, it's a neuronal cytoskeleton gene. And it turns out that a lot of the hundred genes that have been involved uh, in uh, expressed in early fetal brain development are involved in synaptic communications and uh, including uh, uh, neuronal cytoskeleton genes. And, and that's very important because it provides an alternative narrative to what autism is. And, and this is when the aggression against me and our family really s stepped up. They began calling me the OG villain, the original gangster villain, which was pretty, pretty extraordinary. And, and, and that's where it stood. And, and I think it had the impact of taking some of the wind out of the sails of anti-vaccine groups. And what what you started to see though was by 2013, 2014, so many kids were denied access 
to their vaccines like MMR vaccines that you can predict what's going to happen next. There were breakthrough uh, epidemics of childhood infectious diseases, most notably measles, because it's so highly uh, uh, transmissible. And I know Dr. Maldonado is in California was on the front lines of a lot of this that you started to see breakthrough MMR epide um, measles epidemics because of the declines in MMR vaccines. And the California legislature did the right thing, which is to say, you know, now if you want to send your kids to school, they have to be vaccinated. Simple as that. And there were and shut down the exemptions. That was the right thing to do. But what it also did was it energized they the anti-vaccine groups found a way to re-energize under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, that basically said, hey, you know, no state government can tell us what to do. And and it and this took off in here in the state of Texas. Uh, where I am, where under where it aligned itself to the far right, to the Republican Tea Party, and this started getting political contributions, uh, including an anti-vaccine political action committee, an anti-vaccine PAC, under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom, where now we're up to 70,000 kids denied access to their vaccinations, especially in the suburbs of Austin uh, and up in uh, North uh, Texas. And um, so now I found myself not only combating false assertions about vaccines and autism, but actually a, a, a well-funded, well-organized political movement. So this this was no longer mom and pop organizations. This was these they were very aggressive and and they began to dominate the, the internet. And then of course what happened in 2020 was those same groups that protested vaccines under health freedom, medical freedom then began to protest uh, masks and social distancing, and then COVID-19 vaccination. So this is what the state of Texas looks like now. Uh, and you can see it's very much along a, a partisan divide. So here are the vaccination rates in Texas, a little bit better along the border with Mexico, a little bit better in some of the urban areas, this is the urban areas of the Texas Triangle, Dallas-Fort Worth, San Antonio, Austin, Houston. And the vaccination rates are not great, but they're not terrible um, in the in the in the in the liberal and li these liberal areas and these democratically uh, led areas. But in the conservative rural areas, in the central Texas or East Texas, forget it. It's almost like nobody's vaccinated, and and this is why COVID nineteen is just, especially the Delta variant, is just racing through like like a hurricane going over warm water. Um, that's that's how aggressive things are, and, um, and so a lot of this is coming out of uh, conserv out of the far right. It's coming, and you can see this play out on uh, the cable news networks at night, um, uh, where there's a very uh, aggressive anti-vaccine stance, and and not only that, but also going after individual scientists. So you know, I had Laura Ingram and and your governor, Governor DeSantis, go after me on Fox News, which was crazy because I'm looking at this and say, wait a minute, I'm not even, Florida is not even my state. What's he going, what's he going after me for? And so this is part of this anti-vaccine activity. It's not only anti-vaccine, it's anti-science. It's what I call anti-science aggression, not only targeting science, but, but individual uh, scientists. And it's coming out of uh, the conservative news outlets. It's coming out of, you saw this in the CPAC committee um, where um, members of elected members of Congress were basically saying um, first they're going to vaccinate you then they'll take your guns and Bibles away and as ridiculous as that sounds to us a lot of people accepted it or they would say that vaccines are instruments of political control and all of this contributed to this uh, sharp uh, partisan divide and then the targeting of indiv individual scientists like myself or, or Dr. Fauci, which, um, you know, has is, is gotten to be uh, made things very dangerous. In addition to the far right wing extremism, we have a second source of this, which um, the Center for Countering Digital Hate, and it's amazing that we have to have something called the Center for Countering Digital Hate, identifies as the disinformation dozen, a dozen or so uh, non-governmental anti-vaccine groups that dominate the internet um, and have about 60 million followers on various social media sites. So this is another really important source. And um, and now with that, it's started to globalize between the far right-wing extremism and the disinformation dozen. 
now we're starting to see that same health freedom, medical freedom, language and protests expand outside the U.S. So, for, for instance, Canada has never been very anti-vaccine, but now I've been writing about the fact that now we're starting to see uh, anti-vaccine protests contaminating Canada around that same uh, same rhetoric of health freedom, medical freedom. And in Europe, it, now it's, it's gone to, into Berlin, Paris, and London, and the New York Times and BBC have reported links to QAnon and even uh, political extremist groups in Europe on the far right, including neo-Nazi groups, so it's taken a very dark turn. So this is version 3.0 that it started to globalize. And of course, that's not complicated enough. So now we have the fact that um, the other third element to this is Putin and the Russian government. And this has been reported by US and British intelligence that Putin is, is to divide the country even further, has used this systematic campaign of what's being called weaponized health communication to increase the divide um, among our country. And so Putin's and Ru the Russian government have had a huge role in, in, in promoting all of this. So when you look at you know the sources of the, I don't even call it disinformation anymore, I call it anti-science aggression, there are three major sources, and, and it's important to point this out because, you know, we've heard now the White House respond by targeting, you know, saying going after Facebook and the social media companies and the Surgeon General did that in his report. And yes, of course, Facebook has a role in disseminating this, but it's not getting to the sources of the aggression, the sources of the disinformation, which I have identified in this article about the three-headed monster. Are th these are the three heads of the monster. The disinformation doesn't, as identified by the Center for Countering Digital Hate, the far right wing extremism and the political action committees, which unfortunately are becoming more mainstream across the GOP, and then the state actors, especially the Russian government under under President Putin. So what do you do about this? So this is an essay, and I'll finish this in my last slide. This is an essay I've had, just came out in Nature, um, uh, which basically says we've got to take a different look at this and recognize that the old way of doing this in the Department of Health and Human Services, which said, look, we're not going to pay attention to it because it'll just give it oxygen, is no longer adequate. Moreover, I think we have to take this seriously as a, as a cause of loss of life. You know, 100,000 Americans over the summer are basically died because of anti-science. Anti-science aggression is now a leading killer in the United States. And you know, when we talk about the kinds of things that we put up infrastructure to combat things like global terrorism or nuclear proliferation or cyber attacks, my premise is anti-science is a far greater killer than all of those things combined. And yet we're unwilling to look at it through that lens. And that what we need to start thinking about now is to put together a, uh, a an interagency task force in the White House which goes outside the health sector, it could include the health sector, but we have to bring in departments of Homeland Security. We need to bring in Justice Department, Commerce Department, even State Department, and see what our options are. Because I don't think in the health sector we really know, because we've never gone up against things like global terrorism and cyber attacks, but it, it's reached this level. And, and to not be proscriptive and say what we should do and basically say, you know, as health professionals, or in my case, being a physician scientist, I don't know how you combat something like this, but there are people who have that expertise and that's what we have to start looking at. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and I look forward to uh, the comments of my colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harris. I think uh, you, you, have, you give a very clear message on what's going on between science and anti-science. And uh, let me tell you, questions are pouring in. So we're gonna have a, a very active debate when we come back. Um, now we moved with Dr. Benjamin, uh, George Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin, as I said, is a public health physician. He is uh, in charge as uh, executive director of the American Public Health Association and he's gonna be speaking about COVID-19 trends on, uh, in terms of uh, vaccine coverage and case rates in the United States. Dr. Benjamin, I really appreciate you being here with us today. So the floor is yours here. We're just a few blocks away from in, in Washington. So thank you so much for he being here and the floor is yours. Dr. Sure. thank you very much everyone. And thanks for allowing me to spend a little time um, here with you today. Hopefully you can see my slides. 
Um, yes. Great. So let me just remind us, um, you know, obviously the, this is, this has really been a, a really, really terrible uh, pandemic, uh, both globally and the United States. As of yesterday, we had about 44 million cases confirmed and over 700,000 deaths uh, here in the United States. The um, uh, pandemic of, of 1918, 1919 um, caused oh, about 675,000 deaths. Now, we immediate, admittedly, the nation was much smaller in terms of our overall population, but but 700,000 deaths is just really a, a real tragedy, particularly since a lot of them in our most current um, um, experience was were preventable. You know, um, Operation Warp Speed, which gave us these, these safe and effective vaccines um, was absolutely a sound strategic decision. It absolutely accelerated vaccine discovery um, and um, access to vaccines, um, at least from a scientific perspective, it was really a sound financial investment in partnership. Note that this was this came because of about 20 years of experience and research. Um, so it's not something that was done um, um, uh, in a really short period of time. It built on uh, our really strong um, national investment in uh, vaccine research. Um, the problem, of course, is that we spent a lot of money on the development, but not as much time, interest, and focus on the actually delivery, at least not during the early part of the planning. So uh, as you heard from Dr. Hotez, the baseline misinformation and um, disinformation is a big issue. The anti-vaccine uh, activities that continue to this day, um, the fact that the pandemic got politicized very early, um, but at the end of the day, inadequate investment in, in public health infrastructure, um, as well as the fact that we really got started planning late to get shots in the arms um, was remained a big issue. Reminding us that initially because of the amount of vaccine that we had, um, we started a phased vaccine approach. And this is just one of the examples where we just remind us that the advisory committee of immunization practices um, recommended that healthcare professionals and long-term care individuals be the initial group followed by what we at that time thought about as frontline workers um, and, and older individuals. Um, and then at least at that point, we even hadn't gone down to, uh, to adolescence when we initially rolled this out. But even though we did this early on, we began to see some real challenges, um, which ultimately resulted in these disparities we saw um, with between particularly whites, um, African-Americans and Hispanics, um, um, also Native Americans in terms of, of early uh, vaccine uptake. Um, a lot of that was due to the fact that we had um, fundamental distrust in communities of color with not only just government, but also the healthcare system in general. And while there were some historical um, reasons for that distrust, a lot of it had to do with the way people were really being still dealt with, you know, recently. Um, the fact that our health system and many of the societal systems that we have continue to discriminate uh, against individuals. There were certainly concerns about the speed of the development and, and the initial safety of the vaccine. Again, those were those are mostly communications issues where we had not done a really good job early on uh, communicating to people um, um, how we do vaccines, um, why we were able to do this so fast, uh, and the fact that this was built on 20 years of research, not, not something that we just pulled off the closet and the shelf uh, a few days before. Some debates around this, around you know, the prioritization of politics and economics over science became a big debate uh, as part of this. Um, and um, even though diversity of clinical trials was pretty good this time, historically we've not done well in clinical trials and getting communities of color a part of those trials, but this time was different. Uh, a, a Herculean effort was made and that resulted in, in um, a pretty good representation. So what that means is, the vaccines will work on all populations um, that were in which the trials were done. Um, and location didn't matter, even though early on, for example, if you were in a health system that was vaccinating people, um, again, just thinking about some of the structures that we had, you know, if you were one of the physicians and nurses that were kind of in the know, you were much more likely to get vaccinated. You tended to be better informed. Um, your perspectives and concerns about the vaccine um, were, were different from those people who were some of the maintenance workers or 
um, food staff workers and other support personnel in the hospital. And, and so I don't know that we did a really good job early on of, of recognizing people were in different places in terms of their knowledge base uh, around the vaccine and targeting our educational efforts uh, in a way that we better inform people so they can make better informed decisions. And there were structural things. You know, if you were on a janitorial staff, you didn't have access to the hospital email per se um, in, in some situations. So th things like that were just not really well thought through. And of course, those would have been better thought through um, had um, we thought about this at the same time we kicked off the, the research endeavor to bring the vaccine on board, thinking more and more about the delivery side of that. We would have identified a lot of these early on um, and, and acted on them. So building trust became a big issue. The Ad Council, um, and we participated with the APHA and myself, participated with the Ad Council to craft a national public health education campaign using trusted messengers, um, try to address some of these anti-vaccine messages. Um, it had a robust social media campaign, and this campaign was also in multiple um, languages as well. And there was an effort, of course, eventually to address some of these structural barriers. Um, making sure you got vaccinations that actually occurred in the hood, dealing with some of the registration issues. You know, early on to get um, registered to get a vaccine, you had to have access to the internet. And when there was a shortage of vaccine um, slots, um, if you worked and, you know, were a bus driver or you worked um, out of the home, you weren't able to sit in front of your computer um, all day trying to get on, on site to get vaccinated, um, get your, your, your appointment scheduled. Um, and by the time you got home, the end of the day, the, all, the, all the slots were gone. So a lot of efforts to do that. A lot of efforts to set up telephone registration activity, um, systems to get people to getting their shots because quite frankly, not having a car, um, a lot of people just couldn't get to the sites. And at least um, early on, um, the vaccine sites like the testing sites tended to be in places where people that were not in the neighborhoods and were not convenient to get to. And then the Biden administration, of course, um, built on the science um, that occurred in the, the Trump administration, initially had a 1 million vaccinations per day goal and ultimately up to that to 3 million per day. And they were, they were pretty humming along with that, doing quite well in getting people vaccinated, using the Defense Production Act to speed up um, not only vaccine production, but um, getting supplies or testing and PPE in place, um, you know, trying to increase the number of people that can give vaccinations. So we expanded that, um, that, that process, encouraged states to authorize uh, other individuals who are clearly trained and competent in giving shots to be able to do so. And of course, increasing where those shots could be delivered. Um, they took an all hands on deck approach, um, including activating federal resources um, and it also including um, getting rid of some of the bureaucratic barriers used to some of the volunteers um, as part of their process. Now, that was great. They did that. And then, of course, as many of you know, um, eventually ran into a brick wall. So um, that $3 million, 3 million vaccinations a day suddenly um, became um, a much less of that. Um, and even though there were issues around supply chain er early on, that needed to be addressed. The, the problems with vaccinating people really, in many ways, was not a supply chain problem. It was a, it was a pe people wanting to get the vaccine problem and trying to encourage people to get vaccinated became an increasing problem. And as Dr. Hotez showed you, um, uh, very much in um, um, communities based on one's um, views, um, either progressive or conservative um, and political views and, and actually where you voted, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, but at the end of the day, um, today we have 186 million people fully vaccinated in a country of over um, 330 million people. Um, we have uh, over 200 million people who have had at least one dose. Um, we're about 10%, tracking about 10% between these two categories of individuals. So um, over the next 30 to um, 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 uh, 40 days, we should uh, ultimately break that 200 plus million mark to getting people fully vaccinated. There's also been a lot of efforts to try to close these gaps. Um, um, you can see some gaps very early on between 
um, whites. The, the slide, the, the, the graph right there in the center um, are um, white Americans. And then you can see Hispanics and Blacks, the gap between those groups um, have substantially narrowed, partially because we've gotten more African-Americans, Hispanics vaccinated, but also tragically because the, the trajectory of the curve for whites um, has gone down. And what that tells you a lot is, is what's happening um, in terms of encouraging people to get vaccinated um, has continued to be a challenge, particularly in uh, communities that um, have a higher prevalence of, of um, um, non-people of color. So we still at this day have got about 68 million um, more people to go. Um, there are some people who are just dead set against it and some people are still not sure. So there's a great deal of, uh, of people out there that just haven't quite made up their mind um, to do this. Um, as we mentioned, this is, uh, this is political um, in many ways. The states um, that historically um, went democratic uh, tended to have a higher percent of people vaccinated than those states that um, um, leaned um, on the Republican side of the equation. Um, as Dr. Hote has said, you know, it's, it's the equal system which we all live and what people are hearing and what they're believing. Um, let me just reiterate this vaccine is safe and effective. And so the, this politicization is a real concern of mine um, because people are not simply following the science. They're, they're following the, the political whims of the day um, and it's killing people. So we've got mutations occurring, and this is what these viruses do. They mutate, they love the change. Um, and so far we've not had any substantial vaccine escape. We've had a little bit of testing escape. Um, and they're looking at retooling the, the vaccines and the tests to try to address that over time. Um, right now the Delta variant is the most uh, prevalent variant uh, in our country. It turns out this variant is a lot more infectious, uh, which means it's a lot more sticky to your body. Um, if you get exposed to it. Um, I guess the good news is that um, um, you can get vaccinated and the current epidemic um, fundamentally is among those people that are not vaccinated. Um, the communities are not vaccinated. It does not mean that if you're vaccinated, you cannot become infectious. But I do think the good news is, of course, is that that rate is about one per 5,000, which is extraordinarily low, an extraordinarily low rate where you can compare that to other risks that we take each and every day, including going out and driving. Um, the risk of actually being infected by COVID is, is, uh, uh, is much, uh, much uh, less uh, if you're fully vaccinated. We also know that the boosters are now here. Um, and the way to think about these boosters, I know the communications have already been, been confusing. If you're 65 years of age and older, get a booster. If you have a high risk um, from an underlying chronic disease, um, um, if you have an immunocompromised and know it, get a booster. If you have diabetes, hypertension, obesity, kidney disease, um, you most likely will need a booster, but you should counsel your doctor for it. In almost every case, you're gonna get, you're gonna get vaccinated uh, with a third dose. Um, or if you have high exposure. So that means fundamentally people who are in the healthcare environment where uh, both you cannot take the risk of being infected nor um, should you take the risk to your patients and not be vaccinated, um, you should get the booster. When basically we're boosting people is because we're seeing some reductions um, after six months to eight months of um, your immune system in such a way that it puts you at a higher risk of getting infected. The good news is you don't get a higher risk of getting really sick or dying. Um, that's still very low. Um, but we want people to feel much more comfortable. And so that third dose um, is coming. And um, I guess we can talk through the q and I'm sure Peter has a, has a great answer for us on this. But the question is whether this is three and done now or whether or not we'll need annual boosters. I don't know that we really know that for sure, but we should, we should talk about that during the Q&A. Um, we know that vaccines mandates work. In fact, the president is um, out today uh, touting some really um, strong statistics that show that the, <clears throat> the uh, mandates are encouraging people who are on the fence to get vaccinated. Um, and uh, my organization has been strongly supportive of, of vaccine mandates. You know, um, and vaccine passports are here. Um, I don't like the word passports, but uh, I just came back last night from New York City and you can't go anywhere 
um, without you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to any into a building without showing that you're um, that you're fully vaccinated, and um, you got to show your vaccine card. Um, in some places, you have to show um, um, that you've been recently tested. And I was at a meeting where we both had to show our um, vaccine cards, and we got tested every day. Um, so right now, people are taking this very very seriously. I have not was not a fan of vaccine passports. I was mostly concerned about the inequities and disparities. I was very concerned that for people who couldn't be vaccinated um, early on in the process that they would be discriminated against. But um, I've come around because um, the vaccines are now easily available. Um, we fix most of the structural issues, not all of them, but most of the structural issues that keep people from getting vaccinated. Um, and the technology is there for you to either be able to show it through an app or show a picture or take a photocopy, put it in your wallet or purse. Uh, and short where you go. And, and quite frankly, it's not a big deal to show it. Um, I know people are concerned about their personal freedoms, et cetera. Um, but but um, I think when you have a, 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 a disease which is so deadly um, and is almost all preventable, we're gonna have to do everything we can right now to, um, to make sure that we're all safe, as safe as we possibly can be. There's a bunch of things we don't know yet. So we don't know the real impact of the declining protections from the first series. First series meaning the two shots. We know that the population we mentioned earlier are going to get that third booster, but we don't know the full impact and durability of those boosters yet. And that's, you know, it will take time. Um, the disease is less than two years old. Um, we don't know about mixing and matching the brands um, of the vaccines. And I know the FDA is going to tackle that um, probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, children's vaccines are, are pending approval. Um, as you heard um, from Dr. Hotez that the Pfizer officially ask for their vaccine to be used or approved for kids five to 11. Um, we don't know all the implications behind the role of breakthrough cases. You're fully vaccinated um, and now you get infected. We don't know what the role of that is for you to infect other people and act as a carrier. Um, we know something, but we don't know all the answers to that yet. We don't know the vaccine impact on long haul syndrome. You know, if you're vaccinated, what's the long-term risk of you getting the long haul syndrome? We do know it occurs but we don't know what the, the overall impact on that is. We don't know the clinical course, et cetera, yet. But again, people are studying that. I believe the NIH has a research study in, in place right now looking at that. Um, and the protection for potential of variants. Um, again, that still remains um, to be seen because the, they're beginning to do a lot more of those studies in the lab. And eventually, just like with flu vaccine, they'll be able to retool this vaccine pretty easily, in fact. Uh, for potential variants, but we've got to get ahead of the curve, not chase the curve as we've been doing with this outbreak. And then fundamentally, we know the vaccines work. There's no question about it. Um, these vaccines, safe, effective, um, and effective is, is the key word here. No, no question that they, they do what they're designed to do. Um, and that is fundamentally keep you from getting really sick or dying um, and reducing that risk to an extraordinarily low level. Um, and then they're also very good at keeping you from getting um, uh, infected. And interestingly enough, if you have had COVID and then you get vaccinated, there's certainly good evidence that you should do that, um, that you may um, have extraordinary protections as well. So with that, let me um, stop. Thank you. Um, and... Um, Looking forward to the um, Q&A session. Thank you so much, Dr. Benjamin. I think your message was very clear and I think that we're gonna have a very important uh, discussion later on. Now we're gonna move on into, this, uh, into the introduction of uh, the next speaker. Uh, and the next speaker, let me tell you, this is amazing to have a very busy person with us. Dr. Yvonne Maldonado. She's a top professor of global health and infectious diseases, senior associate dean for faculty development and diversity, professor in departments of pediatrics and epidemiology and population health, chief division of infectious diseases, director of global health, child health, department of pediatrics, Stanford University School of Medicine in Stanford, California. Uh, she woke very early to be <laughs> here with us today with the time, uh, with the time zone difference. So I welcome Dr. Yvonne Maldonado, Dr. Maldonado from Washington to California. The floor is yours. 
It's not so early. I've already had my uh, cup of coffee, so I'm very, <laughs> very awake now. Thank you so much. And uh, um, mucho gusto y muchas gracias a todos uh, por su atención. I'm going to speak in English, but obviously there's uh, Spanish and uh, language translation here today. Um, I want to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on children in the United States. And I really appreciate having uh, Drs. Benjamin and Drs. Hotez go ahead of me because they've given you a lot of wonderful information. Um, just my disclosures here, I, do, I am the site investigator here at Stanford for the Pfizer pediatric vaccine trials, as well as for a Pfizer maternal RSV vaccine trial. Those funds go directly uh, to my institution to run the trials. Today, we're gonna briefly discuss uh, pediatric COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations and deaths in the United States, uh, the overall status of the vaccination uh, rates in children in the US, and then to talk a little bit about mask use if we have time. So as you've heard before, uh, unfortunately, we are at a terrible point in this pandemic where we have seen over uh, 700,000 people die in the United States from this disease. Uh, and many of those, as you heard unnecessarily with over 43 million cases in the United States. And this is the four, um, the four uh, wave surges that you've seen since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and what this slide shows you in the light blue are the adult cases. And what we have uh, noticed, especially in our Southern states and some parts of the central part of the United States is that um, pediatric um, cases, hospitalizations and deaths have really been uh, prominent in this last fourth wave. And you can see here that today about a quarter of all the cases are now occurring in children and that's much higher than we had seen throughout the entire pandemic. Now, if we look at the American Academy of Pediatrics website, and I wanna mention that I'm also the chair of the Committee on Infectious Diseases for the Academy, um, and they have pulled together data. And, and one of the other things that we have seen as, and as a pediatrician and an epidemiologist, I have to say that one of the most disappointing things I saw from my perspective is that we didn't really track pediatric or maternal information for a long time. And it wasn't until early this year that the American Academy of Pediatrics was able to pull state level data because there were no other sources for this data in the US. Um, so this data represents uh, combing through all of the 50 US states and compiling data from those websites. So not all of the data is complete because some states don't provide uh, certain uh, variables. So for example, many states don't provide age-based hospitalization rates. But this is what we have and it's a good resource. If you need that information, go to aap.org and you will have a number of different wonderful resources if you are pediatric providers or you want to um, uh, inform your, your family members who have children. So as of this last week, um, this is a report that's put out every two weeks by the AAP. The cumulative number of cases of children is almost 6 million. It's almost 5.9 million, getting close to 6 million cases as judged by COVID-19 infection rates. And given that children have to get a test, we know that this is an underestimate. This represents 16% of all cases since the beginning of the pandemic. And as you saw, about 26% of the cases in the most recent surge. We have seen now, uh, excuse me, uh, a, an a increase of about 7% in the number of cases just in the last two weeks. So we are not in a good place in terms of reduction of cases in children. They're still higher than they were before this surge. So we are concerned. Um, and um, in terms of hospitalization, we know that the data from the state websites uh, uh, for the 24 states that are reporting the data show that about 22,000 children have been hospitalized. But if you look at data from state registries and hospital registries, we think that number just in the last few weeks alone has been about 30,000 children. So clearly what you're seeing here from the states is an underestimate. Now, fortunately, only about uh, at most 2% of children who have COVID will be hospitalized. So we do see that overall the risk of hospitalization in children is relatively low. And the mortality reported overall from the 50 states 
uh, New York City, Puerto Rico, and Guam is about 520 children. Um, about 125 of those children are um, under um, uh, between uh, under uh, 12 years of age. <clears throat> but fortunately, again, very few uh, children with COVID-19 not only have hospitalizations, but have a, a fairly low risk of death. Still in all, these are preventable and we'll come back and talk about that later. Now we know that children uh, have an unusual syndrome called multi-system inflammatory, inflammatory syndrome in children or MISC. And the CDC has been tracking cases. There is an open registry where people can report. And so far <clears throat> as of August of this year, we've seen about 4,600 cases of MISC in children with 41 deaths. So that's a fairly high death rate from this rare complication. We don't really understand the pathogenesis and a number of NIH and other registries are actively enrolling children and trying to understand what the pathogenesis is, who, which children are at risk, what are the long-term sequelae of MISC. But we do know that children with MISC uh, really present with very acute, severe illness with the vast majority requiring ICU hospitalization. Fortunately, as you see the death rate, while it is about 10% of the reported cases is relatively low, the children are assessed and admitted to the hospital very quickly. Now, if you look at time over um, since the beginning of the pandemic, you can see the overall number of child COVID-19 cases per week. And you can see where we are here in the far right. And we are coming down, but the numbers are still at about 175,000 children who have been diagnosed with COVID. And this is, as you saw before, our biggest surge in children. It's quite concerning, especially because we're now starting to enter school. Um, and we'll talk about the implications of vaccination here uh, with, with this surge and how, how we can try to mitigate this um, increasing number of cases in children. If you look at the um, COVID-19 cases per, uh, per region um, in the last, um, since the beginning of the pandemic, you can see that there have been surges in every part of the US, but particularly in the South and in parts of the Midwest. Um, the West has had, um, in the Northeast have had fewer cases overall, um, but again, we are all seeing surges in children under 18 um, and COVID-19. Now, let's talk about <clears throat> the number of uh, vaccinations that we are seeing in children. Um, and this is, I think there's a lot of good news here. Um, first of all, we're very excited that there are vaccines for children, um, but we could be doing a better job. So what we know as of last week is that about 13 million children under 18 have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And this represents a little over half of 12 to 17 year olds. About 10 million of these are fully vaccinated, representing about 45% of 12 to 17 year old children. Um, and however, the number of children re re receiving their first dose has steadily declined over time. And we're hoping, uh, and, and we also see that child vaccination rates vary substantially across states. So in 10 states, over two thirds of children 12 to 17 have received one dose at least. In 21 states, under half have received one dose. So clearly, as you heard from Dr. Uh, uh, Benjamin, we really need to do a better job of getting messaging out that is accurate and, um, and uh, targeted to all of our uh, populations at risk. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vaccines themselves because we know that uh, there has been a number of um, concerns and literature raised about the risks of the vaccine and myocarditis in particular for the mRNA vaccines and particularly in young men. And so this is a slide taken from the CDC. I'm sorry, I forgot to put the source down at the bottom, but this comes from the ACIP uh, from uh, um, the uh, end of August. So you can find this on the CDC ACIP website and uh, um, I will provide the link to our uh, moderators later. But these are the benefits and risks of the Pfizer vaccine. And I'm talking about the Pfizer vaccine specifically because it is the only vaccine that is licensed currently for individuals under 18 years of age. Um, and so if you look at the risk by age group from 16 to 29 years of age for females and males, the risk of myocarditis on the right in red 
and the risk and the, and the number of hospitalizations and ICU admissions averted for every million doses of vaccine given to that age group, you can see that the number of hospitalizations, especially ICU hospitalizations on the left in blue, um, are uh, very highly averted uh, by vaccination relative to the number of myocarditis cases. Now, um, I'll put this in another way. This may be a little easier to see. So if you look at COVID-19 cases prevented by age group and by se uh, sex, uh, as well as hospitalizations and ICU deaths, uh, ICU admissions, compared to the number of myocarditis cases in that age group and that sex um, per million doses, you can see that the numbers really peak in the 16 to 17 year olds. So these are 73 myocarditis ex cases expected per 1 million doses given in that age group. So even though that is um, about um, six dozen cases of myocarditis, um, that is per million. And what we know right now from the data that we've seen, and there, there was a paper was just uh, released yesterday from the New England Journal demonstrating that among uh, the cases, uh, the vaccinated children, uh, people um, 16 years of age and older in Israel, um, the risk of uh, myocarditis was uh, about the same overall as what we were seeing in the US. Um, there's a little bit of a difference between some of the finer age groups, for example, 16 to 17 versus 25 to 29. Um, but they found that 77% uh, 77, 77 of the cases were very mild, 22% were moderate, uh, meaning that only one case was severe and that person um, did survive their ICU stay. So we do know that the myocarditis risk is extremely low. This in, is in the category of very, very rare, but um, the vast majority of the children either do not need to be hospitalized or do are, are discharged in an uh, average about uh, one and a half to two days after their admission. Now, what is the status of other pediatric COVID-19 vaccines? Well, we heard that uh, Pfizer-BioNTech is currently the only approved MR vaccine. It's an mRNA vaccine for children. Full FDA approval has been given for everybody 16 and older, and there is emergency use authorization available for those 12 to 15 years of age. Now, as you heard from Dr. Hotez, uh, the uh, Pfizer um, group did file a full application this morning uh, to the FDA for review of their vaccine uh, for uh, indications for five to 11 year olds. And the, um, uh, the FDA is expected to review this on October 26th with hopefully a decision being made sometime uh, in October or November around this um, EUA application. Uh, the Mo Moderna and Johnson & Johnson uh, companies are also expected to file for pediatric age groups later in this year or early next year, they are doing active studies. Now, let's talk about other downstream impacts. COVID-19 has had a major impact on general pediatric immunizations and well child visits as well. This is critical. Many school-aged children missed their recommended vaccines over the last year due to disruptions associated with COVID-19. And especially concerning at this time are gaps for measles vaccine and vaccines routinely recommended at 11 to 12 years of age. So and schools, because they are overwhelmed with coming back and uh, looking at COVID uh, guidelines and protocols may not be focused on compliance with school vaccine requirements this coming year. So we need to get our children caught up now. We don't wanna have other outbreaks of other vaccine preventable diseases while we're trying to control COVID-19 as well. This is a slide from uh, the CDC looking at the Vaccines for Children program and the orders uh, of vaccines that were, were provided. Um, the uh, numbers in blue represent uh, last year's orders before the pandemic and the orange is this year's order. So you can see overall that we are behind, but we are getting better. That means that VFC providers are being able to order more and more vaccines non-COVID vaccines for general immunization of children. So that's good news. However, if you look overall at the line in green, which is all non-influenza vaccinations for children and the blue line, which is measles vaccination, you can see that we are really not uh, caught up yet. And as of April of earlier this year, this is the most recent data we have, we are down by 11 million doses 
uh, uh, overall. And for measles uh, containing vaccines, we're down about one and a half million doses. And uh, we are having a hard time, especially in the public sector compared to the private sector. Um, so we don't want to miss out on getting our children vaccinated. If you look here at the percent of missed wellness visits by the age of the child, um, as of October of 2020, again, the most recent data we have, you can see that the vast majority of the missed doses are occurring in the older children, 18 months to five years of age. And so we were worried about those children getting caught up on their vac school age vaccinations. If you look at influenza vaccine, you can see here with the 2019 flu season in, in orange and the 2020 flu season in the dark uh, green color, you can see that the overall coverage rates are about the same, but there is a disparity based on race and ethnicity. And we think, as you heard from Dr. Benjamin, that there are a number of disparities in access to care, even among our children. So if we look at the COVID vaccine for, uh, gap for some vaccines over others, we see that there are some differences for rotavirus, uh, pneumococcal and DTaP vaccines, the, the reduction in uh, coverage is somewhere between five and 10%. But if you look at the um, adolescent or preteen groups, the numbers are closer to 15 to 20% for Tdap, HPV, meningococcal vaccine, and importantly, the measles containing vaccines. Um, and we see again that the missed visits uh, overall are much higher among Black and Latinx kids compared to white children. So we need to be concerned about getting our kids vaccinated. This is something that all of us can do is make sure that pediatric populations are getting back to their providers for their vaccines. Now, I'm gonna end with a couple of comments about face mask guidance. Um, this is really important. At this time, we know that we're hearing about um, lifting of mask mandates here in California. We have a statewide mask mandate um, and many um, for, for many areas, for public facing places and federal uh, areas, but um, Overall, schools in California and in many other parts of the country are, are using masks. And even though we have a highly vaccinated population here in California and other parts of the country, we know that because the Delta variant is so transmissible, it's twice as high as the original circulating uh, virus. Uh, even vaccinated individuals at this point are encouraged to mask, especially in school settings. Um, and per CDC guidance, um, they are recommended um, in alignment with uh, federal, state, local, and tribal or territorial laws as well. So school child care programs and camps are encouraged to continue supporting masking. And there were a couple of papers that came out uh, last week from MMWR showing that masks, uh, mask use in camps in areas where masks were used had no outbreaks, whereas mass, uh, mask use uh, that was not enforced in other camps led to a number of outbreaks within those situations. So we know that masks really work, especially among our children under 12 who are not eligible yet for vaccination. We know that effective control requires correct and consistent use of a well-fitting mask. What we like to say is the best mask for a child is the one that they will wear. So we, I, we don't worry as much about using an N95, which children under six can't use anyway, or a cloth versus a surgical mask. But if you can get a well-fitting mask, that a child will wear, and believe me, they are very good at wearing masks, as you, many of you know, uh, that will really be protective of them and other people around them. Now, uh, for around sports, we do still recommend that mask use continue, indoor sports especially, and ex except for when those sports, um, where those masks may become a hazard. For example, swimming is not encouraged, uh, mask use is not encouraged there, obviously. But outdoor sports that have close contact, we are, still, uh, we are still encouraging people to use masks. And they still need to be worn on uh, travel and plane, by plane, bus, or train. Immunocompromised people, for sure, even with a booster, should be considering mask use because their um, likelihood of seroconverting to the vaccine is still on the order of maybe 50 to 80%. So they may, even with a booster, may not be fully protected. And a mask will be very helpful for them. Now, um, in, in, uh, one last uh, area that I wanna talk about is the rationale for vaccinating children. And I can't believe as a vaccinologist and a pediatric global health physician that we actually have to rationalize why we should give children a vaccine that puts them in the hospital and kills them. But nonetheless, that is an argument that many of us are facing. 
So several of my colleagues put together this, um, this little set of tables about a year ago, looking at what we vaccinate for now and what we're averting with those vaccines. Um, and when you put that in the context of, um, of uh, COVID, it's clearly um, there is an imperative to vaccinate our children for COVID. So if we look at meningococcus, pneumococcus, influenza vaccine, rotavirus vaccine, and RSV prophylaxis, we know that the annual number of deaths from those diseases is well less than 200. We are, as I said, we are currently seeing over 500 deaths in children from COVID. So these numbers are much lower and these are currently uh, incorporated uh, vaccines in our general immunization program, as well as for varicella, rubella, hepatitis A and Hib. So there is no question that we can prevent deaths and hospitalizations and we are doing it for other diseases. COVID-19 should be a consideration as well. And then finally, when we look at uh, COVID-19 as a, a cause of death in children, we are fortunate that we have not seen the tremendous impact of mortality in children that we have seen in adults. But if you look on the right-hand side, this is a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine from 2018, looking at all causes of death in children under 18 uh, from 20, the year 2016. And you can see at the top, the overall number of deaths in that age group were 20,000. Uh, these are the top 10 causes of death. And you can see that the majority uh, the most causes are from non-infectious causes, but if you interpolate the 520 deaths into this list, you see that we um, COVID-19 is at least in the top 10 causes of pediatric mortality in the US, and why wouldn't we want to avert those deaths in our children? We also know that reports of maltreatment of children dropped precipitously with the onset of um, lockdown, and what we know about um, this is that people just weren't available to report. There were no eyes on children to watch treatment of children. There was a lot of stressors in families. We do not want to return to a time when children are locked down again at home and not able to access school. Vaccinations and mask use will help prevent that. When we look at the number of children who have lost a parent, oh, about 40,000 children have lost a parent to COVID-19. And when you look at the distribution, as you heard from Dr. Benjamin, we are seeing a racial and ethnic disparity and black and brown children are four times more likely to have lost one or more parents during this pandemic. So again, not only should children be vaccinated, but parents should be vaccinated as well. And the US population as a whole, we have seen that 31%, and this is a, a very conservative estimate, um, have been black or Latinx. And in COVID, pediatric COVID deaths, um, Black or Latinx children are um, the majority of children who have died from this disease. So I'd like to stop there. There's a lot of information available at the AAP website, not only on immunizations, but clinical guidance. There's town hall series that we've been doing every two weeks for many months now, um, and lots of reports and uh, toolkits that you can use for families who have questions about pediatrics. COVID and vaccinations. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Ford. And I don't know, if, yeah, Dr. Hart is here with us as well. So thank you in Houston. So we are a, a multi, multi place, thanks to the technology and to the virtual sessions that we have now. And um, we could start with a few questions here and uh, that we have already been receiving from the very beginning of the, of the panel. So let me tell you, Dr. Hart is people are really, really happy uh, in the participation in terms of uh, the speakers, but also in terms of the of the amount of interest that they have. So one of the questions that is uh, here, uh, and Dr. Hodges, I think this is gonna be key for you to answer. What, what has been the role of, this, of social media in spreading anti-science messages and uh, linking it with the recent 
testimony given to Congress by one former uh, worker at uh, Facebook uh, that Facebook has not been doing enough on stopping and spreading this kind of news. Dr. Harris. Yes. So, yeah, and we've heard it all from the testimony and from the news that Facebook has had a huge role in disseminating um, the disinformation, misinformation. And it's not only Facebook, it's, you know, it's Instagram, it's Twitter, it's, uh, it's, uh, and, and even not only the social media companies, but the e-commerce companies. If you, for instance, if you go to amazon.com right now and you put books up at the top as I'm sure every, everyone has done press return, you'll get a scroll down menu at the left that includes in the middle of the page, something called health, fitness, and dieting. You click on that and you'll get another second scroll down menu called books on vaccinations. You click it on, it's all garbage. It's all fake anti-vaccine COVID conspiracy books. So my books are among the highest ranked pro-vaccine books on Amazon. That's the good news. The bad news is they're ranked about 27, 28 because it's preceded by 26 you know, COVID conspiracy, anti-vaccine books. So Amazon is, you know, one of the leading promoters of anti-vaccine disinformation. My, the point of my lecture, my talk was to say, yes, we need the social media companies to crack down on this. They are monetizing the internet from what they're doing, but it's by focusing exclusively on Facebook and the social media companies, we're ignoring the sources. And it's the sources of what I now call anti-science aggression that we have to go, that we have to do something about. The, the political extremists on the far right, um, the, the disinformation does, and we have to get State Department involved with Russia. And it's much tougher and nobody wants to do it. And um, certainly the Biden administration has done everything they can to avoid doing those things. Instead, what they do is they, they pick on easier things like complaining about Facebook and, and that sort of thing. But they, unless we go after the source of the disinformation and the anti-science aggression, this won't go away. Thank you, Dr. Hardis. I, one, one question linked to this one and uh, you, your role in working with the, with the government. Do you think this, the US government and the agencies are doing enough already to stop all this anti-science? Or should it be upgraded or do more? Because this well, is well, it's it's well. Thank you, Phil. Well, it's not a matter of upgrading. It's they're not doing anything. They're doing zero, basically. I mean, you know, for years, you know, I would, you know, I would write articles about the anti-vaccine movement, and I'd get rebuked by various health and human service agencies. And the message was, Peter, you know, we're we're not talking about this now. We're going to give it oxygen. And and I would complain. I said, you know. You know, and they're good people, but I'd say, you know, you're operating as though everybody's got dial up modem and um, and uh, has a compact computer and uses Ask Jeeves as their search engine. You know, the world has changed. And and now at least Health and Human Services is acknowledging that it's a problem. But again, they're falling short. Again, it's about, um, you know, talking about Facebook and the social media companies. They've not had the appetite to really take on the sources of the anti-science aggression. And, and that's why I've called for the interagency task force that maybe even take it out of the health sector because they're clearly not up to doing anything about it and bringing in Homeland Security and, and, and Justice Department, Commerce Department, State Department. And my rationale is 100,000 Americans have just died by anti-science aggression. And, and it's, it's, by the way, it's a minority viewpoint, right? Or, or it's, a, it's a viewpoint of one. So, um, but, uh, but I, think, I think this has to, ha has to be discussed at the highest levels. And this is going to continue to kill people. And, and it's expanding globally. It's in Canada now. It's in Western Europe. You're starting to see evidence of American anti-style aggression in sub-Saharan Africa. This is a globalizing, this is a globalized force now. Thank you. Now, Dr. Benjamin, I'm going to try to link some of these issues that we already discussed with Dr. Hodges right now. Mm -hmm. But as a member of APHA, I know what the organization is doing. And I know that you have been very vocal 
and uh, all the other different groups in APHA are also working towards spreading the good news, I mean, the evidence-based news on, on vaccines and on COVID. But what, what, is going to, what is APHA going to do when key messages to the population come from appointed scientists or uh, by government officials who do not believe in, in, in all this uh, uh, control of COVID with face masks and vaccines and, and uh, testing. And when you have these fights between health officials that are want to do the correct thing, and then you have the government not allowing them to do it, and then everything mm -hmm. becomes a legal battle. I mean, do we really have to go in public health and, and taking care of the population Go, do we have to really go all the way to a legal battle? And sometimes, I don't know with, which, up to what instance are we gonna come? Are we gonna have to come to the Supreme Court or what? I mean, this is really crazy to see when we're talking about population's health. Dr. Benjamin. Yeah, let me, share, let me tell you about everyone that public health has never been easy. Um, and we've gotta have both a short-term view and approach and a long-term view and approach. Obviously, in the short term, we're going to be struggling. We're going to have to use every tool in the toolkit. That means um, actively advocating for our position. That means um, being more uh, engaged um, in terms of educating the public and speaking out, speaking truth to science, speaking truth to power. Um, we will have to use the courts in some ways um, to make sure that our, our, pub, our public health professionals are safe, um, and allow to do what they do. And we need to do a much better job working with elected officials. Um, and that's the short view. But the long view is we're gonna to have to understand that our nation's gonna to have to become much more literate in science. Um, lots of studies have been done around the public's view around science. Turns out that, that this is a loud minority of people, but they're very loud, they're very organized and they're very efficient. And I think we have to root them out when they, where they are, and we have to go at them in the, in the short term very, very directly. But in the long term, a well-educated, scientifically literate public doesn't mean we won't have disagreements, but this has been terrible. So no one should take away from this me thinking that this has been a good thing. But one of the things that has been good is that our nation for the first time has had a very transparent, loud debate about science. Science has been put into a, in, in front of, in a fishbowl. And so people now know how the scientific process works. They may not truly understand it, but they've been part of the debate. And so what we need to do is give the public the tools to interpret what they're seeing. So in you know, January, if I say, um, masks don't work, and then my understanding of the epidemic, or in this case, the virus changes, and I say, oh my God, masks really do work because I have new evidence. The public can follow that along and say, yeah, the advice we got changed because of X, and the public can properly interpret that. That also means we have to be better at communicating, and um, quite frankly, a lot of our risk communication um, was not up to the science as we know risk communication. And then finally, we have to be better historians because if you actually look at what happened in the great pandemic in 1918, 1919, we had anti mass societies. We had people who didn't, um, public officials who didn't support social distancing. Um, and that resulted in some really terrible outbreaks of influenza, different disease, but influenza many years ago. Um, and so we haven't quite learned from our history. Had we been able to rapidly be a learning institution, remember what happened over 100 years ago, properly integrate that into our planning and, 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 and our processes and better educate the public, we still would have had problems because as Peter points out, this is a dedicated group to getting misinformation. Um, but we would have been better poised to do that and I think had we, I'm going to say 20 years ago, paid a lot more attention to this, this um, the social media world and spent the money, time, and training 
to, uh, to equip our public health physicians, in fact, the whole medical community, in order to, um, to engage more effectively with these folks, um, we would have been much better. It turns out there are more of us that know the, know the truth than it is of them. Can I, I'd like to add a couple of comments. I, I actually, yeah, I, um, I actually was at CDC. I trained there and I worked as a CDC employee. Um, and I can tell you that from my days there to, to today, I still work very closely with my colleagues at CDC um, and at NIH and FDA as well. So we have uh, for decades now ignored the public health infrastructure of this country. Um, there have been calls, papers, books written about the infrastructure, and it's only because of the dedication of our public health officials um, with very minimal resources that we've been able to maintain the public, infra health, the public health infrastructure that we have now. But clearly supporting that infrastructure has become starkly uh, visible to us today. We, we need to follow up on that and make sure that uh, we are continuing to fund. Now, frankly, NIH tends to get the bulk of the federal uh, dollars because people like their, uh, and we, and I absolutely agree, I think NIH should be funded as well as they can be to do their cutting edge research. But if you don't have that public health platform to help implement uh, the changes that need to be made based on the fine research that is done, then um, it's really just publications sitting on a shelf. Um, so we really need to focus on that area as well. And then the last thing I'd like to um, mention is that bringing in our civil society, like we do at the global level, I've worked a lot in other countries, and bringing in civil society to the table as much as possible. So in this case, it would be our independent societies, our infectious disease societies, our pediatric societies, our uh, me uh, medical societies, um, uh, all of these societies that have membership within all of our communities um, are really going to be critical to help spread messages within that local community and try to bolster the forces against this misinformation, which is really deeply entrenched. As you heard, they are not a majority, but they are very vocal and they are very well resourced, and we are not. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. What, let me come back to you in terms of uh, all this information about the, the vaccines for children. Uh, we know that it's only one vaccine that has been approved for under 18. So, but we have a lot of questions in, is a second dose necessary in under 18? Uh, which vaccine will be the best one tested or not tested so far, or whatever the study, uh, the, the, the phase studies are right now for under 12? Uh, in Latin America, it seems to be that Argentina is already vaccinated under 12 uh, with uh, high risk uh, diseases with Sinopharm, what is your view on this, Dr. Maldonado? That's a great question. Um, and I think uh, what we need is a whole uh, palette of different vaccine choices. So I don't think one product over another will be really, will vac we were not going to be vaccinated. Our, we will not be able to vaccinate our way out of this with just one vaccine. We need to have uh, a number of different options for different parts of the world, for different uh, situations, financial, uh, demographic, et cetera. Um, there are limitations to the data that we have for some of the vaccines, for example. And I would say that the transparency of some of the companies has not been um, equal. Uh, we do have a fair amount of transparency in the U.S. because the FDA requires it and because many of us have required it as a condition of uh, endorsing these vaccines. That is, we as society said we would not endorse even a federally approved vaccine if we did not see the data that supported those approvals. So um, I would say that um, all of the vaccine candidates that we have in the U.S. right now, so Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and I think some of the others as well, AstraZeneca um, and the others um, will, including Dr. Hotez's vaccine, will, uh, which I, looks very exciting, I think will all be able to contribute um, to the uh, menu of uh, vaccines that we will be able to select uh, but at this point, uh, right now, today, we need to take what we have on the table. And what we have is one vaccine. We would prefer to have more. And I'm hoping that by uh, the beginning of this next year, we will have more vaccines in the U.S. as we are seeing in other countries. So that's one issue. Um, now, we're familiar as vaccinologists for pedi and pediatric pediatric vaccinologists that many products are put out for, e for different antigens, and they all have nuances. So 
you may need to boost one vaccine earlier than another. There may be more doses needed for one vaccine compared to another. But in the end, having those uh, that ability to pick and choose um, for your specific uh, regional or, or uh, country situation is going to be important. Now, we know that most vaccines in general for children are going to require boosters. I would be highly surprised to look to hear what Peter says, but knowing what I know about the the virology uh, and the the uh, immuno immunology of coronavirus diseases in general, and we know that SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus, that we will see waning immunity. There's no question we're seeing it now in the older populations and in the immunocompromised. Um, I don't have any doubt that eventually we'll see it in all populations. So there will be a booster needed, I'm sure. The big question is that we ask for every vaccine is when will the second booster come? And um, we don't know the answer. Will it be annual like flu? Will it be every 10 years, for example, like Tdap? Uh, we just don't know. But fortunately, we do have the tools to measure that, and we'll be tracking that through the uh, FDA CDC surveillance systems and the uh, post-marketing surveillance for all of these products. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Dr. Horace, I, I think that this is this is kind of a nice introduction to, to where I'm coming, because uh, as you know, the US, Europe have decided which vaccines are the ones that are going to be approving or saying that these are the good vaccines that we think that are working fine. Then we have those of WHO, which is a little, um, there are more vaccines there because they have uh, been uh, doing this to support the COVAX mechanism. But then we have other countries that are having or vaccinating with vaccines that haven't been yet approved by either WHO, the European Union, or the United States. And this is a lot of concern for people in Latin America or other regions about mixing vaccines because for instance, someone says, I have this vaccine that is not approved by the European Union or WHO, but is the one that I got because I didn't have any, any choice. Now I go to the United States, I get a vaccine. What is your feeling about mixing of vaccines uh, because of these issues? And these issues also brings issues of equality and access of inequalities in terms of vaccine access and passports and all those things. Okay. Yeah, so we could do a whole hour on this, but um, <laughs> just a couple of points that I'll make. One is, you know, we, you know, I think this, there was a science policy failure, and the science policy failure was we have 650 million people in Latin America, 1.1 billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa, another billion people in the smaller low-income countries of Southeast Asia. That's 3 billion people. We're going to need 9 billion doses of vaccines. And the the science policy failure was everybody was so focused on innovation and speed, and we got some very interesting vaccines like the, the mRNA vaccines and even the adenovirus vectored vaccines out of it. But nobody really took a step back and said, wait a minute, you know, as any engineer will tell you, it takes time to learn to make 9 billion of anything that's new. So we better balance the portfolio with something that we know we can make 9 billion of right away. And the science policy failure was everybody went so hot and heavy on the innovation that no one thought to add to the portfolio a simple recombinant protein vaccine like the one we've developed. And now we're without any help really from the US government or, or a lot of other agencies from private philanthropy, we've been able to now accelerate this recombinant protein vaccine in India and Indonesia. And we could make 9 billion doses of this vaccine fairly quickly if we had interest in help. So that was that was the science policy failure. Now, as you point out, as a consequence, uh, there's no vax people, there's no vaccine available for Africa or barely anything. Latin America is struggling as is Southeast Asia. And I get calls all the time. And, and my advice is even if a vaccine like say the Sinovac vaccine, you know, from China gives low levels of virus neutralizing antibody, it's better than nothing. Or, or if the, all they have is the Gamalaya Russian vaccine, it's better than nothing, gets you some virus neutralizing antibodies in there. And then, you know, when you can, see if you can get boosted with something that you know will induce higher levels of virus neutralizing antibody as a boost, maybe our vaccine, may, maybe one of the mRNA vaccines. And it's, but it's a, it's, it's a approach that's based on no data. 
right? Because there's very little data on mixing and matching vaccines. I, you know, I would ask, you know, Bonnie, what she thinks the only data or, or George is the only remember data I've really seen is mixing and matching the AstraZeneca vaccine with the Pfizer vaccine. And it looks safe and it looks effective, but, you know, but unfortunately, and anything else where eventually data will be published in time, but not right now. And so there's risk because we don't really know about the safety of mixing and matching vaccines or even the efficacy. It's, it's based on a, it's based on an educated guess as much as anything else. Yeah, I do know that uh, on October 14th and 15th, FDA said they will be looking at some, uh, some data that they've been able to pull together around um, heterologous uh, vaccination, but it's not a prospective controlled studies. I think these are observational retrospective data. So not very much, absolutely. I mean, the situation in the US comes up all the time. Um either because of someone who works in, an, in a global industry, like here in Houston, the oil and gas industry, where they're working abroad and all they have is access to limited types of vaccines, or a more common is uh, a, an adult is bringing their parents over from overseas to the U.S. and all they've gotten is a dose of Sinovac or Gamalea, what should we do? And it's frustrating because there's just not, you know, you can make a recommendation, but then you have to qualify at times 100 and say there's no data, um, either for safety or efficacy. Thank you. Well, let me add to that. I mean, we can do, Friends, the, I mean, please. We can do the animal model pretty easily, um, and we should. Um, you just muted out there, George. Conceptually, we take, we take medications that may have cross-reactions all the time for high blood pressure, for diabetes, for high lipids. I mean, we, we, we do this all the time. Um, and, and then sometimes retroactively we find out, oops, we should have, these two medications um, kind of cancel each other out or neutralize each other, et cetera. I, I think that, that within the same platform, intellectually, there probably is not going to be an issue, but we don't know. And, 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 and uh, both um, Bonnie and Peter are both right. We, we just don't know yet. Um, we really, really do need to do those studies. Those studies need to be constructed. They need to be ongoing. And we need to know for sure. Uh, in the short term, um, we ought to be able to um, um, answer that to some reasonable degree of certainty. But I think that the, um, the fundamental question we have right now is how do we get the rest of the world vaccinated? That is the most important question and, and task that we have in front of us. Um, and as Peter said, yeah, we have to scale up. We have to have a product that we can scale up very, very quickly and get, every, get shots in everybody's arms. That's our essential task right now. But, you know, let's be honest here. Um, this has been, a, remember, let's remember when we had the pandemic uh, flu in 2009 and, uh, you know, who got the first doses of that vaccine? It was, it was, the West, it was developed settings, even though the isolates and the technology, to, the sharing, the data sharing came from uh, Indonesia and other countries, and yet they were last in line. And we vowed that we wouldn't do that again. So. It was very clear a year ago where the contracts were being sold, even before the first dose had rolled off a, a, a conveyor belt. So COVAX did the best they could, I think. Well, I don't know. <laughs> they did something. Uh, but we need to do a better job of making sure that there, you know, we talk about equity, not only in the U.S., but we talk about global equity. And that just does not happen. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I that's, agree. That's a I mean, lesson I we have to learn. I, I agree. I think, you know, I think COVAX is a is a good program and it was well designed and it was very thoughtful, but it was built on the premise that the vaccines would be there. And so the failure was not COVAX so much, it was the science policy failure upstream that never thought that they needed to deliver a vaccine that could actually be scaled for the world. And, and that's, that's where the failure was. It was just too much focus on uh, innovation and speed and not enough on, and if, you know, if we had the support early on, you know, who, you know, I didn't have to spend the first four few months of the pandemic raising money, uh, who knows, we might have the world vaccinated by now. So that's, that's the frustration. If I sound frustrated and angry, I'm, that's because I'm frustrated and angry. No, I can, I can imagine that. And I think that is, uh, it was an issue of, uh, how many vaccines they can produce in a timely manner. And I think, as you said, they were focusing more into the innovation 
and uh, how fast they came. And, uh, but this is also this thing in terms of, uh, this vaccine is, is creating an issue of access of vaccines, Dr. Benjamin. And I think that this is an issue in terms of access related, uh, you, you mentioned something in your, in your presentation about communication and messages being given to specific groups here in the United States. Did, did the health community do enough in terms of messages to African-Americans, messages to Hispanics, giving that uh, Hispanics and other <coughs> groups might be a lot of uh, illegal immigrants and they might be afraid of uh, being caught because they went to for a vaccination. And, and then try to link this in terms of access and messages to mandating vaccines and the response of certain groups when, when someone is going to travel to Brazil, they say, you have to have yellow fever vaccine. And if you don't have it, you cannot come in. So we go and have our yellow fever vaccine and everybody's happy. Uh, if you're going to certain countries, you have to have your typhoid or your, or your cholera vaccine and that's it, everybody's happy because I want to protect myself. But when you say here, you have to have the COVID vaccine, you have these emotional reactions. I think this is more, it goes into the visceral reaction and uh, I cannot put it in words how I see these reactions coming from people that might be with a very well level of education, but still this is a visceral reaction to this. Dr. Dr. Benjamin. Yeah, the, the policy incoherence um, um, is enormous. And look, um, we understand human beings are human beings. And um, you know, sometimes we act emotionally on things um, based on um, and, and sometimes we do things that are not in our own best interest. There's no question about that. And no, the, um, when I talked about the fact that, yeah, we did a great job of thinking through the science, I think Peter's right. The one piece of the you know, issue wasn't the balance of innovation versus um, scale up and, and production. Um, the production piece wasn't thought up as well as it needed to be. You know, they, they kind of assumed that they could make a car, they could they could, they could mass produce it. And it turns out that that's not the case. And not only the case because of the lack of actually um, capacity, but even the capacity for raw materials. You know, anytime you're using a new technology, which we did with mRNA vaccines, you've got to deal with the raw material and making those little, little pieces of RNA um, um, is probably technically okay, but you need the raw material to do it. You need the, the physical plants to do it. Uh, that's, that's one thing. Um, it's always always easy to, to do something that you know how to do versus something new. That's always true. But I do think that that we we didn't, when I say we, I mean the, the corporate we, everyone, you know, the idea of giving somebody a little piece of genetic material um, without thinking through how people would hear that and and doing the early message work. I mean, they started doing the, 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 the um, um, the actual ad assessments, the public messaging studies um, late in the summer, not early on. I mean, had they started doing this at the same time we started producing the vaccine, we would have been way ahead of the curve. Had we started talking about putting the plans together for vaccine delivery, we, I think they just thought, boy, we can just put this out in the market and those shots would go right into the arms. And of course, that's not the case. And by the way, even doing H1N1, right? The last time we had an influenza pandemic of note, a lot of the disparities were known from that outbreak. And those lessons weren't pulled forward in any kind of meaningful way. So I think the, the challenge is um, we continue to learn. Um, but, and by the way, it takes money to do that. Um, I mean, the, uh, it's not just money for innovation, but we still don't have a big national ad campaign um, to the extent that um, you know, out of the out of, out of using government dollars, I know they put away about what two hundred million dollars for an ad campaign that never really kind of quite got off the ground. Um, so no, it 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 hasn't been well thought through or implemented. Thank no, <laughs> thank you. And I, think that's, I mean, uh, I think you know one of the pro one of the that's problems right. it was, you know, when Operation Warp Speed was launched in twenty twenty, there was no. Um, in the language, in the contracts, there was nothing about communications. And so all of the communications 
was ceded to the companies. And the problem is when a CEO of a company sends out a press release, it's not meant for you, it's not meant for me, it's meant for the shareholders, and it's meant to jack up the stock prices. And and that's always worked in the past, but now with this under the microscope, it was done in a way that was tone deaf to its impact on public health. So you saw how the, the, the company press releases spectacularized the accomplishments of the company, made it seem like they just whipped up these vaccines in a few days. And when it fails to fail to mention that it built on 10 years of 10, 20 years of R and D. And so that created a lot of instability and, and it, it tended to make MRNA vaccines seem like something space age and something out of Star Trek. And, and when it wasn't, that's a technology that's been around also for decades. And, that caused a lot of damage and we've been playing catch up ever since. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Maldonado, uh, uh, this is, you, you were presenting data on, on what was happening with other vaccines during the pandemic. And, uh, uh, and it's not only in the United States, we have been doing some, uh, some work with Dr. Carlos Espinal of FIU in Latin America, understanding what has the impact of pandemic into the vaccine preventable program. And, and we have seen that coverages have been going down rapidly in many countries. Some of them, very few, have been able to manage the same high coverages, but others, most of them, are going down. And I guess that is going to happen more or less as COVID vaccine acceptance in, 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 in the United States. What are your concerns? And my concern is that because of lockdown, there were not a lot of children mixing that were unvaccinated. But now we have now almost two years of COVID and uh, and many children have not been going to school. They're starting going to school now. And uh, are you concerned that we're gonna be seeing here in the United States a lot of vaccine preventable diseases because of low coverages? And what is going to be the impact of all these anti-science and anti-vax into vaccine preventable programs? Dr. Maldonado. Yeah, absolutely. So Peter and I have been part of a number of different papers that we've been writing, <laughs> trying to write as much as possible to our colleagues about the, the dangers of medical exemptions, the dangers of not uh, ensuring that children are vaccinated when they go to school. And there are a number of scenarios where we could easily at this point uh, have measles outbreaks in the United States. And I bring up measles because it's the most transmissible or one of the most transmissible viruses that we know of other than chicken pox. Um, it, and so with our coverage rates as they exist, even before the pandemic, we were just on the edge, on the cusp of, of, of being, uh, you know, one case of one imported case away from outbreaks, like we saw in 2014 at, at the uh, Disneyland situation. We are not that far away even before the pandemic. So now with these, uh, missing vaccinations, we're more concerned than ever. Um, uh, the, the, the issue is really, again, making sure that we support the schools and being able to support the mandate, the uh, vaccine requirements. Um, we don't have very many states that have uh, man school mandates uh, or, non, uh, or uh, reduction in non-medical exemptions. California, West Virginia, and um, Missouri are the three states that have uh, eliminated anything but medical exemptions for general pediatric vaccines. Um, it's a funny group of states, but there are the three of us. And uh, we've been able to show that with that, our, uh, our number of non-medical exemptions have dropped, of course. But unfortunately, we've also seen a rise in medical exemptions, which we can only take to mean that uh, some of those are not, not real medical exemptions. And we're seeing the same, of course, with covid so, um, so we are concerned. Um, this is a message that the um, I, you know, some of us, Peter and I, and others have been putting out as much as possible. We also, through the American Academy of Pediatrics, we have taken a stand as well that we don't believe in non-medical exemptions for general vaccines for kids. Now, as you know, this is one other issue about the U.S. system. We are a federal system, but we also have state networks. So each state can make their own decision. Um, and um, many of the states have chosen not to follow those general recommendations. So uh, we are at risk, especially uh, if you see what happened this last year. Let me give you an example. 
we didn't have any RSV or any influenza last winter. None. I'm, maybe a handful of cases in the world. I think uh, around the world, we might have seen a total of, you know, a thousand cases of flu in, in, in the surveillance that was done across all countries. Um, but what happened is when people started going back um, to social uh, life, uh, we saw a big RSV upsurge, not only in the United States, but in the Southern Hemisphere. And the unusual thing about it is this uptick happened during the spring, springtime for the Southern Hemisphere, springtime for the U.S., which is extremely atypical. I don't think we've ever seen that. It's a winter virus. And so our concern is as kids go back to school, we know based on lots of data that if children go back to school, even if they can't be vaccinated, if they're masked and they're reasonably distanced, we can prevent outbreaks. But if you are have a double whammy of A, no vaccine uh, mandates or even no vaccine recommendations, plus a reduction or an obstacle to vaccine mask mandates, you are going to see uh, diseases uh, proliferate in school settings. And that is completely avoidable. We know that's true. Many people say it's not possible, but we have data from North Carolina. We have data from Massachusetts and from other settings as well that masking uh, really does work if even if you can't be vaccinated. So um, I am concerned. Uh, one of the other areas that this is going to impact, of course, is not just uh, a school absenteeism, which we really can't afford, given all of the lags in developmental uh, accomplishments over this last year. But the fact is, even in a normal year, non-COVID year, hospitals are pretty stretched uh, with influenza and RSV admissions. So if we have normal RSV and influenza on top of COVID and other issues, um, all of our hospital systems across the country are going to be stressed um, this winter. So it is not only a pediatric issue, it's a general health system issue. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Maduro. I think this is uh, great what you're saying in terms of what's going that the risks that we might be facing here in the United States. But Dr. Benjamin, Dr. Horace, probably what also is the issue in access to vaccines and access to vaccines of adults that may protect children, like influenza, for instance, if the parents get vaccinated, probably the, the, the risk of uh, infecting the child will, will minimize. But what will happen with these populations, Dr. Benjamin, that are uninsured, and if they want to seek for an influenza vaccine, it's between 40 and $80 per shot. I mean, this also brings a, a, an issue of access. And uh, what will be your concerns from the American Public Health Association or a broad public health perspective? And then oh, we, we pose the same question to Dr. Hollis. Yeah, for children in the country, we have a pretty good um, safety net program for vaccines. Um, it, it isn't as robust for adults by any means. We need to really create a, a robust adult vaccination program in the United States. But I do think, just to take a step back, um, we've allowed the vaccine programs in our country kind of just to um, grow up over time. We really haven't stepped back and done a strategic look and say, okay, here's, here's the vaccines that we want people to have and here's why for protection. Here's how they're paid for on a universal basis. Here's how um, we assure people have access to them. And this is across the full spectrum of ages. Um, and then here's how we're gonna build an infrastructure to do it because increasingly, we have less and less companies making vaccines at a much more, you know, the costs are going up and the ability to pay for them um, is going down. So from a structural problem, we've got to step back and I think and build and rethink about what the, the product is we want. How do we incentivize companies better to deliver it, make them? Um, how do we build in the capacity for new vaccines and how do we build the enterprise to rapidly scale it up? And, um, and then of course, how you pay for it in a country where we don't have universal access to healthcare. So for me, the first thing we need to do is get a, a system with everybody in and nobody out. Um, and then we need to build this vaccine enterprise around it so that people actually have access to what is probably one of the most, the greatest public health achievements um, we've ever had and that is vaccines. 
Thank you, Dr. Horace. Let me just round up the same question that I took with Dr. Benjamin, but adding a little bit something more. Do you think that as influenza vaccine changes every year, do you think that with these new variants, and I don't know if there, you have any variants in the horizon that may be so 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 contagious as Delta, do you think that also COVID vaccine will need to change and be modeled according to the variants? Will that be possible? Yeah, I, I don't think we know. I mean, it, it really depends on how well these third immunizations for the two mRNA vaccines and the second J&J vax dose, which will also happen, um, revs up virus neutralizing antibodies and how long the protection lasts. And if it lasts a long time, it could be that it could be years before we would need a booster. We may not need a booster uh, every year. But the, the scientific community is somewhat divided. For instance, Michelle Nussenzweig just came out with a paper in Nature showing that um, if you uh, vaccinate with, with that third immunization, yes, you get a big boost in virus neutralizing antibodies, but there's not much epitope broadening. So now it could be that the level, the, the amount of virus neutralizing antibodies enough, so it will still uh, be adequate, but that that's an unknown. So what we really need to do is is the following. One, we need to get everybody fully immunized, and now the bar has changed for what it means to be fully immunized. Three doses for the mRNA, two for the J and J. Get vaccine coverage up to eighty to ninety percent in the country if we're going to halt transmission, and then we've got to vaccinate the world because if we and we have to do all that together because we've already learned what happens when we allow large populations to go unvaccinated. Remember the alpha variant, the B117 variant, arose out of an unvaccinated UK population in September of 2020 out of Southeast England. Delta arose out of an unvaccinated population uh, coming out of India uh, early in 2021. So mother nature is already telling us how she's gonna generate variants. She's gonna generate variants whenever we leave millions of people unvaccinated. And, and that's got to be a, a priority, not only because of the humanitarian uh, concerns, but if we're going to limit the uh, emergence of highly transmissible variants. And can I just add there, I just wanted to add something about the, the genomic stability of this virus, because it really plays into the issue of the transmissibility. Some of the data that we pulled from some of, we've had a number of studies here uh, doing antiviral studies and household transmission studies. We pulled a lot of those samples and we've done whole genome sequencing. This virus is remarkably stable. It doesn't mutate that quickly. And we predicted that based on its structure. So what that tells us is that this virus is not mutating more quickly than we expected. It's just being transmitted at a very high rate. So the more infections you're getting, the more risk. It's not about this virus itself being um, the bad actor, if you will. It is a, actually a slow mutating virus as we predicted to 10 to the minus four mutations uh, um, per thousand. Uh, so one mutation per, uh, per 10,000 uh, nucleotides, but it is just being, ex people are just being exposed at such a high rate because it's now mutated into a transmissible form and because so many people are exposed. So what the message here is, if you don't vaccinate or mask or both, you're just going to set yourself up for many more opportunities for this virus to create more variants of concern. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And, and by the way, one of the anti-vaccine talking points coming from the political right and, and this bullpen of intellectual, so-called intellect, pseudo-intellectuals that they've cultivated is that it's the vaccine the variants, and we know that's not true. It's, it's these, these, our worst variants are emerging among, among, among unvaccinated populations. Thank you. We are coming into the last five minutes of, of our session. And, uh, but I have a very quick question for you, Dr. Maldonado. So please try to be brief. And then we're going to, I'm going to give you one minute each for closing remarks. But Dr. Maldonado, I think that this is not only and you presented data on orphans. And I think that uh, the pandemic has had a different impact on children other than the isolation and the schooling and all those things that we know. But are you concerned of other risks in children other than myocarditis because of vaccines, but also 
what is going to happen? What's happening in the wellness of children? What is happening on the mental health of children? This particular virus, we didn't have time to talk about it, but when you talk to my pediatric colleagues um, in, in the front lines, they are despair. They are in despair. Children have uh, lost milestones. They have lost developmental opportunities. They are facing mental health crises um, and they are losing their parents. They're losing family members, especially among our populations of color in lower sociodemographic areas. Uh, we are very concerned about these issues with children. Now, fortunately, children are resilient, but if we don't give them a safety net, they are not going to be able to recover uh, in a fashion that other children with more resources are going to be able to do. So absolutely, um, this vaccine, this virus, this pandemic has had non-infectious uh, implications that are going to um, really impact this young generation. Thank you. So for the closing remarks, we go in the same order that we have the presentations. Dr. Horace, Dr. Benjamin, and Dr. Maldonado. Dr. Horace, please, you have one minute. Well, I think the, the, the message is um, that there's two pieces that we have to address and, and we need the Biden administration to step up um, as well as the UN agencies. One, we need a plan, a global plan to vaccinate the world. What we've not heard is anybody um, even have the courage to articulate the scope of the problem to do it as we've been saying nine billion nine billion doses of vaccines here's what the inventory that we currently have in hand here's the plan for how we're going to close that gap and, and we need to do that now and second we're also not going to solve this problem unless we counteract the anti-science aggression and find and find approaches to doing that those are the two things that we need to make this happen Thank you, Dr. Benjamin. Yeah, this, these vaccines are safe and effective and everybody should get the vaccine. There's, there, there is no, unless you have a, a really, really clear medical indication, um, contraindication of taking the vaccine, there's no reason not to get the vaccine. Um, everyone should get vaccinated. So those of you in your audience, get vaccinated. Bring your friends and family members in, get vaccinated. The faster we get everybody vaccinated, the faster we'll be able to go back to do the things we want to do. Thank you. And we can be, each one of us can convince someone to get vaccinated and we're going to be doing a great job. Dr. Maldonado. Well, um, as again, an infectious epidemiologist, one of the things that I'm thinking about now is not only how to deal with this immediate issue, but how do we deal with the future pandemic? How do we build the infrastructure that we, uh, our, that we have now, build it, reinforce it, pivot, make it stronger and really forecast how we can provide resources to address the next pandemic. We don't know where it's gonna come from. We don't know what it's gonna look like, but we need to be ready and we need to do this at a global scale. Um, if we're going to keep our children, our next generation healthy, they're already facing global climate change issues, many other political upheavals. We need to at least be prepared for the next infectious disease pandemic. And I think we have the tools to do that. Thank you. So I really want to thank you all for, for being here with us. Uh, our wonderful speakers, I really appreciate your support. It was an amazing panel. I thank all the audience for, for joining us. But I also thank my hosts here in, in FIU offices in Washington, D.C., Carlos Becerra, Diana, Lazaro for hosting me and setting all this beautiful uh, office for me and lighting and uh, Wi-Fi access to be here with you today. So thank you so much. And I leave you now for a brief break, five minute break for the next session uh, that Dr. Angel Rask is gonna be moderating. Thank you so much. And we'll see you probably next year in the new series of the summit. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.